I would view this coordinates as y, x, y, z. It was nonsense. And I said, I agree with you, you know, but it's the way we do it. So I don't know how many times when you're working with a lot of software programs, the default is x, y, because it's the worldwide standard. And if you forget to toggle it, all load coordinates in there are out of order. And then everything blows up, and it takes like 15 minutes, you know, four times. Then you realize this coordinate mark. And so we've got to be real careful there, um, noting that we do both in this country, um, and we've got to, I've got to be careful there. So let's see. Basically, this is a 2D coordinate system. It's the old system, MAD 27, the new system, MAD 83. So we've been doing the coordinate system transformations for our last assignment. In most textbooks, you won't see the rotation matrix as cosines and sines. You'll see A's and B's. So what have they done? They multiplied the scale factor through the rotation matrix so A is equal to S cosine theta, B is equal to S sine theta, and then your translations, instead of calling them Tx and Ty, or T primes, they call them C and D. So the four parameters are A, B, C, and D. So they call it a four parameter transformation. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's take our 2D coordinate system transformations and apply it to a problem like this. Now, the problem is that we run into how many points do I have to know in each system to do a coordinate transformation? So if I want to compute the parameters, A, B, C, and D, how many points do I have to know in both systems? Two. Two. And that gives me a unique solution for the scale factor, the rotation angle, and the translation. What if I have more than two points? Any subset of two points gives me a different solution, doesn't it? So what do we do? Well, we use a least squares adjustment. So we'll do a quick least squares adjust adjustment introduction here. So in this case, we have four points, A, B, C, uh, E, and what happened to D? <laughs> I don't know. So. Uh, we have four points that are known in both systems, and then we have any number of points that are only in 27. So we went out and we, we resurveyed some of the control monuments in the old network and have 83 coordinates on them. We're going to take the rest of them and then just run them through a transformation to get estimates for the MAD 83 state plane coordinates. So. Um, that complicates our life. We can't, you know, we don't, um, we, we need to get the scale factor, rotation angle, and translations, and we're going to estimate it from the four points known in both systems. We'll do a best fit kind of thing. So let's see if we can do that. Um, this is what we refer to as the design matrix or the B matrix, and this is what it contains. So the X1 coordinate, X uh, for point A or point one, and then the Y coordinate for point A, and then a one and a zero, and what have you. Let's go ahead and populate this. So let's, let's go ahead and do that, and then we'll continue through the spreadsheet.
check in nine over. I think I grabbed the wrong number here a couple of places. Let's see. This should be X one Y one, X two Y two, X three Y three. That doesn't look like Y three. I grabbed one down. Okay, and then X four Y four, and then these are just switched. So we switched coordinates. Your second, uh, your negative x1 is. That should be a x1, good eye. Okay. And then that, yeah. The other one is. Okay, yeah. That's probably the hardest part of the whole thing <laughs> is keeping your eyes from crossing and getting the. Okay, now uh, we have the z matrix. We need to compute. The N matrix. So the normal equation matrix, if you look at the equation over here, it would be transpose times B. So you can come over here and transpose the B matrix and then do a two-step process. I'm going to build it into a one-step, highlight the whole uh, N matrix, and then type in equals and then ULP. And then array one will be a transpose. Transpose of, and then we highlight the D matrix, close in parentheses, and then multiply D transpose times B. Close in parentheses, and then what's the magic key sequence? Control Alt Enter. Control Alt Enter, unless you have the newest version of Excel. Excel. So, um, oops, actually I said that wrong. Uh, it is control shift enter. Yeah, there we go. Okay, not all. Um, so, that is all. Did you select that whole huge box or? Yeah, yeah okay. you gotta select the output matrix. So we have to highlight the output array which is a four by four array and drawing the boxes around them makes them easier. And then we just enter the formula here in D transpose B. Okay, and again, you can do this as a two-step process. You can come over here and transpose B and then just grab this times this one into a matrix if you're not comfortable with embedding one equation into another. So whatever is easiest for you. Yeah, still getting some different values in your your, your first matrix is um, let's see. Like my negative four. Two eight three. Yeah, eight, so am I. Three, it's like you have three, that seven twenty and then one seven. You have like X five and the X the negative X four. Yeah, the, good. the last two negative ones, like negative x3. Yeah, this one then should be a um, y1, y2, and then y3. Yeah, and then That when you can just update the formula. Now, notice what happened with the um, the matrix here. What does uh, notice the pattern that this matrix has? The off diagonal elements are all the same, so it's called a symmetric matrix. So if you've done everything correctly, the N matrix will not only be a square matrix, it'll be a, a, a symmetric matrix. And a minute ago, it wasn't symmetric. So that's my key that I've got a mistake somewhere. 
that this matrix has to be symmetric, the off-diagonal elements, it has to be a mirror image around, around the main diagonal from upper left to lower right. So if it's not, that's a good sign to don't go any further. You got, you got something wrong here. Okay, um, so everybody get the end matrix to work for them? Uh, okay, what's that? Yeah, if you can read it from back there. <laughs> So we do a matrix multiply, and then embedded in it, the first matrix is a transpose, which we form of operations that does a transpose and then multiplies it by the second matrix. You might want to just clear it out and redo it. Um, sometimes there's a little something in the formula, you could look at it for hours and never see it. And if you just delete it and redo it, sometimes it's good to go. So if you can't see a mistake in a formula easily, I just delete them and redo them. It typically saves you a lot of time to just redo the formula. Found a way to make that formula bar like really big. Oh, I've never figured that out. How do we do that? It's in the it's in the options, and you have to like restart the, oh. the thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've never. Um, I, that actually would be useful to know. Or it makes it easier to see what you're working on. Yeah. When I'm working alone, it's fine, but on the overhead here, you know, nobody can see it perfectly, so I'll have to try to remember that and look it up. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and move on here. So that's, you're multiplying the transpose of the B matrix times the, times the times B matrix. The B matrix. So I've got to take this matrix. When you transpose, it becomes a 4 by 8. So I can do that over here if you want. You can highlight a four by eight and then say equals transpose of this matrix. Then you just do a matrix multiply and grab the transpose times B and it gives the M. So when you're starting out, you might want to do a two-step process. Find an open area, make the transpose B, multiply it, get your normal equations. The T matrix then. I guess what are we what are we doing there exactly? The B. When you're multiplying that times the transpose? When, when you do the least squares class, you'll derive these equations, and you'll okay. wish you did it. All right, I'll wait. <laughs> so, you know, you will gladly wait. Uh, okay, so this, in linear algebra speak, this is the orthogonal projection from the observation space to the solution space. Okay, so yeah, 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 we're good to go. We're good. We gotta do something called the F matrix down here, which is just numeric values. It is the E1, N1, E2, N2. These are the, the northings and eastings in 80, the 83 state plane. So we've got to copy those down here. I'm gonna make my spreadsheet a little smaller to help me get, get that done. So this is equal to See if we can do another matrix multiply. So equals MM ULT array one is the um, B transpose again. So equals transpose of the D matrix, comma, array two is the F matrix, close in parenthesis, control shift in it. Oh, I forgot to put in closing parentheses here. 
now I'll show you where that would be at. Okay, so there's my T matrix. And let's, um, okay, everybody get a T matrix? Okay, so Brenda, can you take a look at that cell spreadsheet and see if you can get them going? Um, okay, well, just going down the line here, we need the delta matrix, which is the inverse of the N matrix times the T matrix. So let's see if we can do that here. So delta, highlight the output equals then ULT, and I have to do an inverse of the normal equation. No, that's not the same as a tree. Okay. If I can type in the inverse, it's the inverse of the N matrix. I've got to remember my closing parenthesis, comma, and then the T matrix. Closing parenthesis, and then control shift enter. Okay. So, everybody get the numbers for the delta matrix. Now, this first number is A. That is S times the sine of the, the um, S times the cosine of the rotation angle. This is S times the sine of the rotation angle. These are the uh, translations, the X and Y translation. So those are our four parameters uh, we talked about earlier. So now, if I want to get the least, the estimate of the coordinates of the last point there, I run it through the formula where the east coordinate for the unknown points is AX plus BY plus C. The north coordinate is AY minus BX plus D. So let's see if we can compute the northings and easting of the uh, a point we only have known in the 27 coordinate system. So let's see if we can come down here. I'm going to make it a little smaller again. And I want to come in into my formula. Equals the A value times the state plus coordinate X value for station O plus the So this is done routinely in software. Uh, the four parameter transformation is built into your data collectors and you can run a routine and it will convert coordinates for you. And basically this is what it's doing, is the four parameter transformation. So let's see, anybody else get these numbers? Yeah. Uh, okay. For the T, it's like, my equation must be wrong. It's almost an error, but it looks the same as yours now. Um, it's, it's dealing with Trevor's thing. Trevor's looks like it has the same equation and just pops it like the air value. I'll look at that here in a minute. Um, yeah, so let's see. Uh, MMULT, parenthesis, minvers, parenthesis, and then we do the uh, B matrix, comma, and then the T matrix. 
Yeah. I don't even have the team major. Or you don't have the team. That, that's where it's okay. I put those down. Let's see. Let me go back up to the team matrix. Uh, so let's see. The team matrix. Uh, did you get the F matrix? Mm -hmm. uh, did the numbers and some get switched in there? So uh, is it, is it, okay. And is your V matrix the same as this one? Parenthesis transpose my like V matrix. Be sure to get your closing parenthesis, comma, and then highlight the F matrix here, and then control shift enter. And uh, maybe that's the problem. I didn't do control shift enter. Oh yeah, that will catch you up to you big time. Um, that is the magic sequence for all the matrix multiplying stuff. Yeah. Is the control shift enter? You can't just hit the enter button. Okay, so let's see. Now, uh, here's a question for you. How, how reliable might this transformation be? These, the, the coordinates that I'm going to transform from 27 state plane to 83, are they good within a few millimeters? Or might they be off by 10 meters? How would I determine that? Well, one of the beauties of the least squares adjustment, it shows you the, uh, so least squares, if you would, is finding the best fit. It shows you the difference between each point and the best fit. Those are called the residuals. So let's take a look and compute the residuals for the four points we use to compute the adjustment. And that's this formula, V equals F minus B delta. Let's see if we can do some residuals here. And we highlight the matrix, and then we put in equals, and we can highlight the F matrix minus MMULT, and then we highlight the V matrix. Residuals. Um, everybody get that to work for them. So look at this. The difference between the old and the new system is hovering from one to four millimeters. And as a check, we should expect roughly the same number of positives and negatives. We shouldn't expect all negative or positives or else there's some systematic effect. So this looks like it's random error and the, the level of fit is really quite good. So this appears to be uh, a network where the old coordinates are of pretty high quality, the new coordinates are of high quality, they fit well together. What if you had one point where the residuals were quite high compared to the other ones, what might that tell us? Something wrong with it? Yeah, like maybe uh, somebody run, run over it with a truck <laughs> you know, and the monument got moved or bent or something. Um, so, yeah, a lot of times you just delete that one, and then the rest of them are good. So this gives you some QA, QC, some quality control to go in and look for maybe a bad point, a typo in a coordinate, or, or something like that. Okay. So let's see. Trevor, how's it going for you?
just for fun, what if somebody wanted to know what is the rotation angle in the scale factor? And we are given ABCD. How would you take the condensed parameters where somebody has multiplied the scale factor through? Uh, how would you how would we unpack that to get the rotation angle? So let me zoom in a bit more here. So what do I have to do uh, to get the rotation angle theta? Mathematically, if I want to isolate theta from this expression, what would I do? Well, I've got, what, two unknowns, S and theta, in each equation. But if I have two equations and two unknowns, I should be able to solve it, right? Sound familiar? So what do I have to do? Let's be a little, a little more sneaky here. What if I were to divide the B equation by the A equation, what happens? The S's cancel out. What is sine divided by cosine? One. Well, you're thinking sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. But um, let's see, I guess I don't have an easy way to write. But let's see, this is opposite over hypotenuse divided by then the adjacent over hypotenuse. When you invert and multiply, what do you get? The tangent. So the arc tangent of B over A is the rotation angle. So in case somebody wanted to see that, this is equal to a tan of the b value divided by the a value, parenthesis. And that's in radians, which I can't stare at that and make much sense of it. So let's do hbd to hms of degrees. So basically, um, the rotation angle is really small, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, how would I get the scale factor? Well, if I know s, if I know a and, and theta, I can compute s. So either from either one of these take theta in A or theta in B and compute S. So let's see what the scale factor would, would look like here. So this would be equal to the A value divided by the cosine of the rotation angle in radians. And, ho oh, oh, does that look kind of familiar? This is roughly than feet to meters, isn't it? However, because of the field errors, it's not the exact definition, but 0 0.308, um, 304, yeah, so it's close, so it, it makes sense. We're going from the original state planes are in survey feet, and I probably should update this with um, putting in S feet. All of MAV 27, the international foot didn't let us get. So these have to be survey feet to meters. Okay. Gotta love the networks. is an application of the uh, 2D coordinate system transformation. 
So we did it generically for our assignment three, and then why don't we apply it to something that we do routinely in the survey? So, okay, Trevor, did you get caught up there? Okay. Um, in the essence of time, I'd like to move on, then I can work with you, and uh, we can do garbage work. Um, let's do a couple of things then. Uh, I'm going to come back to this example last. Let's uh, work with actual potential surfaces here. So here it is a exaggerated geoid model. Uh, the blue is a low spot. The orange or light um, magenta is a high spots kind of thing. So in other words, the if, if you had just the earth was made up of water, uh, no mountains or anything, and the gravitational field didn't change, then the, the water would conform itself to this surface. So south of the Indian subcontinent is a low spot. It's about 100 meters lower than most of the rest of the geoid surface. So does that mean if you're sitting here in a boat, it'll slide down to the low spot? No, because water thinks it's flat. That's not a low spot. The gravitational potential here is the same as here and here. So the amount of work done to go from, say, the center of the, uh, the uh, mass center of the Earth to any of these points on the surface is the same. So let's see if we can do that. So let's see, a quick reminder here acceleration than meters per second squared. Um, gravity acceleration is particularly what we're working with. The acceleration of gravity varies across the Earth's surface. Um, because of the shape of the Earth, you're further from the mass center at the equator than the pole. And to make it worse, the equator has centrifugal acceleration. The outward component for zero at the pole, max at the equator. So at the equator, the, the uh, gravitational acceleration is quite a bit less than the poles. Um, remember what Twitch Olympic a long time ago was in Mexico City, up at 7,000 feet. And they said, oh, because we're near the equator and we're a long ways from the spin axis, then theoretically, you could throw a shot put or a javelin, you know, like a javelin throw might be several inches further than if you were up near the poles. So one of the Olympics was in Helsinki in Finland, and gravity is working against you. You're close to the spin axis, and so nobody can throw anything as far as you could at Mexico City. I don't think it made any real difference, but you know, there's a lot of other things going on there. Anyway, so. Let's see if then, so force is mass times acceleration. What if we took one kilogram? Well, if we take a one kilogram mass, then the work moved to, the work needed to move one kilogram, one meter vertically is the same as the acceleration, isn't it? We're just multiplying by one to make our life easy. So let's say somewhere we have an equipotential surface with the same amount of work. So it's gonna take the same amount of work to, um, to go up to this surface, and as the gravitational force varies, the distance to that surface is gonna vary. So let's see, how would I compute the distance then? So if I know the, um, the amount of, of work, is it work force times distance? Yeah, it is. So work is in newton meters is then the the distance times the um, the work. Okay. So uh, we just got to divide. So I'm going to divide this by the the work, and that the units cancel out. I'm left with meters. So let's do that. Let's go through each of these points. And this is going to be equal to the amount of work to get to the surface 
divided by the, actually I want this one, the mosquito torus, and just copy them down. And notice that the distance to the geoid, so from the ellipsoid to the geoid, or an equipotential surface or a level surface, is going to vary based on the acceleration of gravity, which changes. So at these distances is going to define a water level surface. So if we, if we were to dig a trench from the surface of the earth, and this was the bottom of the trench, then water would fill the trench to the same depth everywhere, wouldn't it? Because the trench is level. Water says that's a level trench. The, the surface has the same gravity uh, potential. The potential energy is the same everywhere. So water is not going to you know, fill it deeper here and shallower. It's, it's going to echo that. Okay, so that one, most of us have to think about a little bit. But um, what do we call these, uh, this height? The distance from the ellipsoid to the geoid is the geoid height. Okay, and let's go to, everybody get the numbers filled in? Okay, let's go to height systems. And I'm gonna zoom in on this diagram a little bit. Um, so, let's see, from the ellipsoid, perpendicular up to a point on the surface of the earth is the ellipsoid height little h. We've been working with that. Um, if I go from a surface of equal gravitational potential, perpendicular to this surface, well, let's see, perpendicular to this surface, up to the terrain point, that's the orthometric height, capital H. Um, capital H named for the geodesist Helmert. In Europe, they call them Helmert heights. Uh, we call it orthometric height. Now notice that this is actually a curved line, and we won't explain why, but the curvature is tiny. So for all practical purposes, we can say that the pink line and then this extension are the same. Um, oh, on top of Mount Everest, they might differ a couple millimeters or something, but for all practical purposes, they're the same. So the distance from the ellipsoid to the geoid is the geoid height capital N, or NG in this formula. Most textbooks don't put a G on it. Um, so let's see. In the lower 48 states, the ellipsoid is above the geoid. In Alaska, the geoid rises above the ellipsoid. So anybody work in Alaska? Most of Alaska, what do you wear for foot gear? Knee-high rubber boots. They're Alaska tennis shoes because Alaska has tundra, which is frozen ground with some muskeg stuff growing on it. When you step on it, then this ice water seeps up about to your ankles. So you can't wear leather boots unless you want to freeze to death and everything. So the way I think of it um, is that uh, um, the geoid height convention, if I go from the ellipsoid outward is going to be positive, from the ellipsoid inward is negative. So in the lower 48, all of your geoid heights are negative numbers somewhere hovering around 20 meters. In Alaska, they're positive numbers. Well, whenever you're in Alaska, I'm positive that my feet are wet. My feet are positively wet. Okay, so that's a mnemonic that you might use to, maybe you prefer to forget, maybe you can remember it, but in Alaska, I'm positive my feet are wet, so therefore the geoid has to be above the ellipsoid to have wet feet. Okay, so, um, if the, here's the equation then, that we generally just put an equal sign here. If I want to compute the ellipsoid height, and I'm given the um, orthometric height and the geoid height, 
then I just add it together algebraically. But again, in a lower 48, what is the sign of the geoid height? It's negative. So I'm adding a negative. And what if I wanted to compute capital H? Well, that would be little h minus n, which is negative, you're subtracting a negative number, so you add it. Um, this, this problem in some shape shows up on the Oregon PLS exam virtually every year. And the exam committee members, which Professor Marker was one of them, said that sadly, at least half of the people sitting for the PLS don't understand this and they can't work it. We, they use GPS every day. So that's kind of sad, you know, you don't know what the tools you're using are doing. So that's what, let's see if we can, we can figure this out here. So what is it that defines the geoid? The geoid is a water level surface. So if you think of mean sea level, if you could extend sea level through the continents, if there was no wind, no waves, no currents, no temperature differences, then this would be sea level. Sea level would not be a smooth uh, mathematical surface like the ellipsoid, it would be this undulating surface. So, um, let's look. I wanted to take more time to go through the NGS data sheets, but for every control monument like Station Ager, Altamont is in the fairgrounds parking lot here in Klamath Falls. They give you a bunch of stuff. So here is the NAD 83. Um, the um, uh, the realization of is the 2011 realization at the epic or point of January 1st, 2010. So we got to be real careful anymore because there's a dozen flavors of NAD 83. And let's see, here is the orthometric height uh, in meters. And it says it was adjusted. Well, adjusted means that we, the NGS leveled through it. So they have leveling network and they use gravity information, threw it into a least squares adjustment to get this number. Now, if you take the geoid height here, negative 22.758 meters from a worldwide, um, it's a minimum surface curvature fit to the geoid heights around the world. If you just compute it, it will interpolate. So based on grid points, it will interpolate and say, well, at this point, here's my estimated geoid height. And if we take the ellipsoid height, Let's see how they compare to the adjusted one. So let's come down here. What is the ellipsoid height of the data sheet? It is the 12.7.515 meters. What is the geoid height from geoid 11? It is the negative 22.758 meters and when I go to compute orthometric height, capital H, how do I do that? This is equal to, or let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> what is the orthometric height off the data sheet? It is, the, the green is all the inner numbers. So the green is the inner uh, orthometric height, which is the 1250.269 meters. Okay, now let's do some computations. How do I compute the orthometric height? So if I was given the ellipsoid height little h and the geoid height capital N, what do I gotta do to get orthometric height? Okay, and remember the geoid height's a negative number, so we wind up with subtracting the negative. So that's gonna be equal to the ellipsoid height minus the geoid height. And notice it's not quite the same. On the data sheet, it's 125269. If we run it through the formula, we get 125273. So let's just do a difference between them just for fun. So equals the known minus 
they differ by four millimeters, which isn't a lot, but again, why do they differ? Well, again, this is um, based on a worldwide best fit surface that they interpolate at Station Altamont, the interpolated geoite height is this much, and this, um, that gives us this orthometric height. This one was based on leveling. We actually leveled through Altamont, put it into a least squares adjustment, and it gives us a little better value, a little more reliable value than the, the computed one, but they're getting pretty good. You go back a couple of decades and Geoid heights sometimes were only published to the nearest decimeter. We didn't know them any better than that. Now, for a while they went to centimeters, now we're down to millimeters, and the fit is pretty good anymore. Okay. So, everybody get the um, computations done there? Okay. So, that's... Um, Oh, there's a lot more stuff on the data sheet than we're going to have time to go through. But think about it. If we go back to the earlier example, if I wanted to lay out a trench here, what is the orthometric height at points along the trench? The orthometric height is different, isn't it? So how convenient is that? If you want to go out with your construction crew, you can't just pick an elevation and say, I want a flat trench, and the elevation of different points on the trench will be different. How, so what would, it, what would be more useful would be a number that represents the work or potential of the surface. So I want a number that would be the same everywhere. And NGS gives us that on the data sheet. Those are dynamic heights. So dynamic heights um, would be the same. The dynamic height everywhere along the geoid would be the same, whereas the um, orthometric heights would, actually I said that wrong. The, um, let's go back up to the terrain surface. So if I had a, a trench up here which followed the geoid, which would be flat, the um, orthometric heights would differ, but the dynamic heights would all be a constant. So for maybe Corps of Engineers working with canals going across states, for geophysicists, then um, they would use dynamic heights routinely. Anyway, um, data sheets have a wealth of information. They're designed not only for surveyors, but for archeologists, geophysicists, uh, engineers, and, and other people. So um, these are great. Um, okay, and I guess we're running over time here. So the last closing comment, um, you're fortunate we're running out of time or this would be a homework assignment. But anyway, so here is, if we're given geocentric coordinates, X, Y, Z, 3D Cartesians, and if I want latitude, longitude, height, it turns out here's the equation to get latitude, geodetic latitude. It's the arc tangent of this expression. Well, let's look at it. You've got to know the Z coordinate, the X, Y coordinates, you've got to know the eccentricity of your ellipsoid, and then we've got to know what's capital N again? Radius of curvature in the plane of defined vertical, and what's little h? Ellipsoid uh, height. Yeah. Well, okay. Look at look at the um, radius of curvature in the defined vertical as a function of latitude. So if I substitute this in, I'm trying to find latitude. It is one of the variables over here, and notice that the ellipsoid height is a function of latitude. So how can I find latitude if I've got to know the latitude to get H and M? Let's see, Houston, we've got a problem here. 
But what would be a reasonable way to work around this? N is like, what, six million some meters? Most of our ellipsoid heights are 1,000 meters. Even Mount Everest is 8,000 meters. So what if we just arbitrarily said that the um, ellipsoid height is zero? What happens to this equation? N over N becomes one. This drops out. I don't have to know latitude to get an approximation of latitude. So I can do the arc tangent of this expression and it gives me a latitude. It won't be correct, but it'll be pretty close. So we take a simplified approach and we get a rough value of latitude. And now with latitude, I can compute N and I can compute then H. Knowing N and H, I can use the full formula and get a better latitude. Then I recompute N and H, and I just keep doing this until the latitude is not changing in the fifth decimals of a second, and the ellipsoid height is good to a millimeter or tenth of a millimeter. And then the cool thing is, if you get this done correctly, you can go use the NGS software and you get the exact same values. It's kind of gratifying to reproduce the NGS uh, equations. So this one, if, if you're interested down the road, this gives you a feel for you know, some of the complexities that the ellipsoid causes us. Okay, so let's see. Uh, that's all I wanted to cover for today. I'll give you a spreadsheet with hopefully we can use as a learning tool. Um, so in particular, take the time to get familiar with the concept of what is the geoid, um, what is an orthometric height or quote elevation, um, geoid heights and ellipsoid heights and the relationship between them, and then you'll, you'll no doubt see this on an FS exam or a, a licensing exam, pretty good chance you'll see it again. So just something we need to be uh, familiar with in the GPS survey world. Okay, anything else for today? Okay, very good.